All right, so welcome back. Uh, we're back in Henslick now. Uh, so again, sorry about that on Monday, but uh, we're going to continue today with strings. In fact, we'll finish up today with, sh with strings, uh, and on Monday we'll start on file I.O. Uh, I just want to make sure that my mic is working here just a second. Yep, good. All right, so uh, remember we are live on Piazza, and uh, I've, I've, I've got uh, YouTube streaming here We can, uh, if you want to use that as a chat as well. Uh, we, uh, we looked at uh, the basics of strings, and you got a lot of practice yesterday in your lab uh, with uh, finishing a basic horse or hangman game uh, and doing some basic string processing. What we're going to do now is we're going to look at uh, more string processing. So, uh, for example, one common thing that you're going to do with strings is taking a substring. Uh, a substring is simply just, here's a string, you want only a chunk of it, right? Uh, may, maybe you want a chunk of it starting at the beginning, uh, and you only want the first 10 characters or something like that, or you want a chunk of it uh, somewhere in the middle, uh, or you, you're searching through a string, you find what you want, and then you want to cut that out and copy it over to some, something else. Uh, so often, often you want to, uh, to uh, get a part or of a string or a substring, right? Uh, and we've actually already looked at the tools to do this in C, right? Uh, to do this in C, you can use strncpy. Remember that strncpy, that n, is a byte limiting version, that it limits it to only however many bytes you want. If you only want a substring of length five, then you provide str copy with a with, with a you know a, a five, and it only copies uh, those uh, five characters over. So uh, as a demonstration here, let's go ahead and go back to CS50, and I'll go ahead and create a, a, a string like I was doing last time with my full name. Uh, and remember, the way that you create a string is a character array char name, and I'll just make it uh, large enough to hold my name. Well, actually, I don't even need to do that. I'll let the compiler take care of it for me. Uh, Chris. Uh, my, uh, Christopher Michael Burke. There we go. I'll use my first name, a full first name, my middle name, and my last name. And what I want to do is I want to extract just my middle name. In other words, I want only part of this. To get started, let's actually go ahead and just get my nickname right here. So char nickname, right? With the uh, short name if you want instead of a nickname. I guess that's more pro uh, proper uh, of a short name. So C H R A S. How big of an array do I need to hold those five characters? Just an array of size five? Nope. Six. Why? That null terminating character. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy the first five bytes right? using strncpy. strncpy into short name, name, but I only want five bytes. All right. Now remember the contract of the uh, the uh, str or the uh, one of the assumptions that strncpy has is that if it see if it sees that null terminating character in the first n bytes, then it'll copy it for you and it'll take care of it for you. If it doesn't see that n, uh, that uh, null terminating character in that first n bytes, then it becomes your responsibility to put it there. In this case, chras, we're not going to see a null terminating character. So if I want to print this out, print up, hello. Hello, me, right, S, and the line, and short name. So if I want to print this out, is this, is this well-defined behavior right now? This will probably work. TCC demo, right, and run it. It'll probably work, but what am I risking here? What, what was the second answer to the second, or the answer to the second question on, uh, or the first question on your lab yesterday? What happens if you don't null terminate a string? Anything goes, right? Undefined behavior. It could, it could we, we could get away with it like we just did right here, uh, or uh, it could result in a segmentation fault. Uh, many people observed a stack smashing event, et cetera, right? So what I need to do is I need to take care of that myself. Short name of the last one, which is gonna be at index five, zero, one, two, three, four, and then five, right? is going to be equal to the null terminating character. It is not zero. You can, you can do this, but it's not recommended. Uh, this is because of the ASCII text table. Uh, this is the proper way of doing it, okay? And this won't make, uh, be, uh, make any difference because we were getting away with it anyway, but now there's no undefined behavior. 
I think if you ran the first version through Valgrind, it may or may not catch anything like that because the compiler is probably filling it with null, null bytes anyway. Okay. Uh, but now what I want to do is I want to copy my middle name. Right? So char middle name. And my middle name is M-I-C-H-A-E-L, so that's going to be seven characters. Nope, how many characters do I need? Eight, because of that null terminating character. And so, eight. There we go. Now I want to copy Michael. Now if I just copy using strncpy, strncpy into middle name, uh, my full name, and at most eight bytes, and then of course take care of uh, take care of this just like I did before of uh, eight of seven, right? Right? Uh, no, it should be wait zero one two three four five. So uh, M I C H A M. Uh, <laughs> I'm off here. That's right, right? Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, that'll be seven characters, which is Michael. And uh, yeah, that, that's correct. All right, so sorry. <laughs> All right, what's going to happen here? This is going to end up printing out what? Or right, let me go ahead and actually print it out here. And the middle name instead of the short name. Right? This will always begin at the start of... Oops, what did I do wrong? Middle name, name... And then short name, sorry. So we're, now we're seeing the consequences of not properly null terminating. Finally, uh, it's actually showing up here uh, because I null terminated the short name instead of my middle name. All right, undefined behavior, anything can happen. Right? There, Chris Toll, right? That's not what I wanted. I wanted Michael, right? I wanted to go in the middle of the string right here. Well, where is this? So what, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7... 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, at index 12. Right? I want to do this starting at index 12. You have to be careful here, though. Name, that's basically a char star. That's a character array. Name of 12 is only a single character, a char. So by, uh, by putting in an index there in uh, uh, square brackets, I have caused an array to become a single element. What I want is the memory address that starts at that element so that I can continue uh, to treat it as a string. So if it starts out as a char star, indexing makes it into a char. How do I make it back into a char star so that it works? You can see right here that the compiler is not going to like this, right? Because that is a char, right? Name of 12 is a char, but it's expecting a char star. So how do I change a regular old variable into a pointer variable? Ampersand. And now when I do this, I should get the behavior that I wanted. Hello, Michael, right? instead of that. So you can go ahead and start at an arbitrary index, but you have to be careful because once you index something, it becomes a regular old character. If you want the memory address of that, oops, that's not what I wanted. If you want the memory address of that, then you need to put in the referencing operator again. Right? All right, I will make sure that you have this in your notes so that you can refer to it later. Right. That's substrings, and you can just basically use the tools that we've already covered, strncpy. You can use strncat in the same way if you want to. You can start concatenating at a particular index. Yeah? When we use strncpy, can we give it a byte? Are we assuming that that's just one character? Or do we have to do size of character? Good, good question. Yeah, yeah, so in this case, I, I, I do think it's OK to put a, just a, So the question is, should we uh, always assume it's a byte? Yeah, go, you go ahead. Uh, I really only do uh, do it with malloc in order to um, in order to be consistent with what, how we've used malloc already. Right? Uh, I don't think that it'll ever be anything other than one byte ever. Uh, uh, but uh, in this case, it's going to end up being. Uh, in fact, I don't. Um, oops, that's not what I wanted. Uh, let's go with man strncpy. Uh, let's see what the actual value is. Yep, indeed, it is a size variable here. So technically, technically, you should put in uh, size of, 
to be absolutely interoperable, but there's no way that there's any system out there where a character is anything other than a one byte that I know of. All right. Okay, good question. Uh, there's some other convenient functions that are not necessarily in the string library. Of course, there's a lot more, uh, more in the, the string library than I just covered. Uh, there are a dozen or so functions. How would you know what is there that you can use and reuse and don't have to reinvent the wheel? RTM, right? Pull up Google, look up string.h, and look at and see what you've got there uh, and wh what it does, right? Uh, but there's also another library, uh, other conve convenience functions. Right? that operate on single characters that you can do uh, use to do string processing. Uh, the C type library, type.h library, provides many other useful functions for single characters. For example, there's an is alpha, right? char c. Right? And this will return true if uh, c is uh, an alpha numeric character. So in other words, if it's A through Z, capital or lower, or zero through N, I believe as well. But if it's an exclamation point or a question mark or a space or something like that, it'll return false. Uh, well, what about spaces, right? Is space, char C, returns true if C is a space character. Not just a space character, but you know, a space or a tab or an endline character or anything else that can be interpreted as a space character that would include say not this is something that you don't generally use but the r character there's a difference between uh slash n slash r uh, it dates back to the ascii text table when it was created of course what did people type on they typed on typewriters and there was a vertical carriage return where you can take the drum on a typewriter and simply just move it up one and so that you were in the same column, but one line down. Or when you got to the end of the line, you know, you've heard old, old timey typewriters, ding. And what do you do? You push it all the way back to the beginning. So it goes to the next line and then goes all the way back to the left. And that's the difference between slash R slash N. It mostly only ever comes up with Windows program, or with Windows, because Windows N line characters are both of those things. Uh, for, for some odd reason. But every, everywhere else in the rest of the world, it's just slash n, backslash n, right? Uh, you also have other convenience methods like uh, to, uh, is upper or is lower, right? And these return true if c is, uh, is an upper case or lower case uh, character. So if it's a punctuation character like exclamation point, it'll return false. Uh, you also have conversion functions to upper right? and to lower. Right? These will convert to the lower or upper equivalent. Right? Well, switch those two things around. And so if you uh, here, if you give it an exclamation point, it'll actually convert the exclamation point to the uppercase exclamation point, meaning that it'll just return exclamation point back to you. Uh, but if, it, uh, if you're going to upper and it, you give it a lowercase a, it'll give you an uppercase a. If you give it an uppercase a, then it'll give you the uppercase a back. So it works on any, uh, any value there, right? Others would include, say, is digit, right, uh, of c, which is going to be returned true if it's 0 through, uh, through 9, right? True for 0 through 9 characters, uh, et cetera. And so again, what else do you have there? What might be find convenient? RTM, pull up a Google page on a C type library, uh, start looking, oh, hey, that's the thing I'm looking for. Or that's not quite the, what I need. I need. I need that one and that one. I'll just go ahead and combine those two. If it's an uppercase letter or if it's a numerical character, right? Then th that's, that's the condition I want, right? Uh, the, the biggest mistake that we see uh, from beginning programmers is, well, I need to uh, I need to check if it's A or if it's B or if it's C, and you end up with this big giant uh, condition of if it's any of these things, right? Or a little bit smarter would be if it's between A and N, right? If it's greater than or equal to lowercase A, greater or less than or equal to uh, uh, upper uh, lowercase Z, right? Then it's within the range of A to Z. That's a little bit smarter, but why 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 do that at all? Just use the C type library. Don't reinvent the wheel. Find out what you already have available to you and use it. Right? 
Uh, there's uh, also a string formatting functions. Right. So recall, recall that printf formats a string and prints it to the standard output. Right. You also have a sprintf. So what do you think the S in front of that stands for? Print, print F, of course, stands for print formatted. But what do you think the S in, in front of that is standing for? String. String print formatted, right? Formats a string and prints it to a given string buffer, right? In other words, just a string. You're treating it as a buffer, uh, a, a temporary workspace, if you want to, if you want to think of it like that. That you want to uh, combine two names together or something like that, right? Uh, so, for example, let's go ahead and do that. Let's go ahead and create my first name, right? Chris, and char last name. Work. Now, if I want to format this as last name, comma, space, first, uh, first name. I could do that with a series of str cat, str cat, str cat, right? Or I could just do it with one call, right? Char formatted name. And I'll just make it big enough because I don't know how many, I'm not, I don't want to count those up. Five, six, uh, I don't like doing basic uh, addition like that. So let's go ahead and just make it big enough to fit my formatted name here, right? All right, so once we do that, we can call sprintf. Right? Now, what does sprintf look like, man? S printf. So you can see that we actually have way more printf functions than just printf and print f, uh, s printf. In fact, in the next module, we'll look at f printf. Uh, the next module is file IO. So what do you think f stands for? File print formatted. Instead of printing to the standard output, it prints to a file instead. Okay. Uh, I don't remember what the rest of these are, but they're 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 variadic or they're. Uh, uh, they're dynamic uh, pr uh, printf statements instead. I forget. It doesn't really matter. Let's take a look at sprintf. Where are you? All right. Well, let's go back up and uh, let's just look at the. Uh, uh, oh, there, there it is. All right. There's the signature that I want. Right. The first argument is not a format anymore. The first argument is the string that you want to print to. Then you give it the format, and then you give it all of the arguments that you want to print. So if I wanted to print, th print this to my formatted name string right here, that would be my first argument. Then I would put in a percent %s, comma, percent %s. This is going to be last name, comma, first name. So I'll put in last name, first name. Right. And when I do this, of course, nothing's going to happen because I'm not doing anything with it. It'll compile, hopefully. Oops. Uh, <laughs> duh. Those are supposed to be strings. There we go. And of course, it's not going to do anything. Why? Well, I'm not printing anything. sprintf does not print to the standard output. If I did this instead, printf, and didn't have this formatted name here, then it would do it, right? This is the, what you're normally uh, familiar with. Burke, comma, Chris. No inline character here because I didn't put one. So let's go ahead and back that up. And printf, now we can print it out to the standard output if we want. Uh, hello, percent %s, and the line, formatted name. DCC, right. and we can see that we get that behavior here. Hello, Burke, comma, Chris. Uh, this has been printed, in other words, stored in this string right here. Right. Now, I made this big enough in order to hold my name. I, I thought it would be big enough. Right. Uh, I, that's basically me treating this as a buffer. Uh, in other words, I'm going to create some temporary workspace so that I can fill it up uh, and you know uh, and call sprintf if I really want to, and then not and not have to worry about uh, you know dynamically allocating exactly as much space as I want, which would involve going uh, string length on the first name, string length on the last name plus uh, two for these two characters, plus another one for the null terminating character. I don't want to have to worry about those details. So what I'm doing is I'm kind of cheating here a little bit by using this as a buffer. You can go ahead and make your buffer as big as you want. Just don't make it too big. Why? This is a static string. What happens when you create a static string on the stack and it's way too big? What happens? Stack smash or segmentation fault in this case, right? 
I don't know why it d didn't interpret it as a stack smash because it should have. Uh, but we'll just go ahead and make it a thousand because nobody has a, 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 a formatted name that's more than a thousand characters, right? Uh, now, if you if you're conservative about it and you say well, 100 characters, there are certainly people that have you know, five family names and three middle names and a junior and a title doctor, the third or whatever. Uh, and you could definitely overflow, uh, overflow that buffer. Buffer overflow happens when you've got a buffer and then you write too much to the buffer. And when that happens, you've got an, a buffer overflow or a buffer overrun or wh whatever you want to call it. I've made this big enough. It's reasonably big enough. If I want to now create a dynamic string that is exactly the length that I need, I can do that. Char uh, uh, formatted name, char star, excuse me. And I'll call this what it was, buffer, right? or buff for short. And then I don't need to print this anymore. I'll, I'll print it out at the end here. Formatted name is equal to a call to malloc. Remember we talked about uh, dynamic strings already yes, on Monday. All right. uh, it's no different than on an array of integers, but except for what's the big difference? No difference. I, I, I should have said that there's one small difference. How big of how big of a string do I need to hold whatever's in this buffer? Str len of buffer. But what else do I need? Plus one for the null terminating character. Once I've got that, then I can go ahead and uh, copy strcpy into formatted name, the buffer. And now I've got my formatted name here. Right? So this buffer was basically, uh, I, I, don't, I would have to go through and count everything up and do a bunch of arithmetic uh, to find out how big of a buffer I actually need, then dynamically allocate it like this, or just guesstimate and overguesstimate and use that as a buffer. That's a common technique. It is still kind of dangerous because if anybody does come along and has a, fo a formatted name uh, or tries to enter, a, a, the, like tries to be malicious about it and, and attempts to cause a buffer overflow by holding their finger down on the, uh, the H button or something like that and giving us more than a thousand characters, this is definitely not safe. Right? This will definitely have a buffer overflow. Uh, it'll end up corrupting our own stack memory and it's potentially a, an avenue for uh, an inject, uh, a code injection attack, right? uh, which we won't go get into in this, uh, this course. But basically you can replace, uh, if you can replace where the return address is on the stack, you can force it to jump to a new memory location and start executing uh, arbitrary code, right? Mm, cool. Uh, but otherwise, this is not that big of a deal. All right, hello, Bert, comma, Chris. Uh, now, there's no need to clean up this buffer, right? In fact, I can't. Free, uh, once I'm done with it, I'll try to free the buffer. What's going to happen here? That was statically allocated. Can you deallocate? Can you clean up stack space? Oh, good. There's even a warning about it. Attempt to free a non-heap object buffer. You can't do that, right? That you're trying to destroy your own stack? Nope, you can't do that. All right, well, I could, once I'm done with it, free up the formatted name though. Why? Because it was dynamically allocated with malloc. Once I'm done with it, of course, there. Now it's nice and clean, okay? All right, so that's sprintf. Everything that you know about printf can now apply to sprintf, including all the placeholders, percent %d for integers, uh, percent uh, C for a single character if you really want, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, percent S, whatever, right? All, also the formatting, you know, if, if you want to pad it out with zeros or pad it out with uh, uh, spaces or something like that, okay? Now, the big thing today is going to be string tokenizing. Right? Often data is formatted. Right? For example, in CSV format or TSV format. Uh, th these are flat files, flat file formats. Right? Uh, you've probably seen CSV data before. If you double click a CSV file, what comes up? Excel, right? usually. Uh, although on my Mac here, they've been forcing me to open, up, open it up with numbers lately and I've got to fix that. Uh, but in any case, what are CSV data? It is comma 
separated value data. Alright. What is TSV data, do you think? Tab separated value data. Alright. So in other words, what, the, the format of this, uh, here I'll just give you an example. Uh, this is actually, uh, I, so this is data about me. Uh, this is my first name, comma. There's my last name, comma. There's my NUID, comma. Uh, there, uh, there's my city, my state, and my office number. Actually, that's my old office number. So uh, let's change that to sure. Uh, I think it's 103, but I'm not sure. It doesn't matter because it's not open to the public right now. Right? Uh, we're under the, uh, uh, the stadium on the south side of the stadium. Yeah. So what it, what what th this this data is formatted in that it's got tokens. It's got one piece of data, comma, another piece of data, comma, another piece of data. What I want to do is I want to process this string and pull out each one of these pieces of data. Each piece of data is called a token. Right? The first token, then the second token, the third token. Those delimiters. Each one of these uh, has a delimiter, uh, a uh, comma as a delimiter, right? Uh, because that's the separator. We want to just ignore those things. Now, you might be asking yourself, what happens when you've got, say, a comma actually in your data? Right? Uh, for example, uh, uh, I can't think of one right now, but you know, uh, if you've got a full address and then there are commas in that or something, or last name, comma, first name, or something like that, if there's a comma in your data, then it gets a lot more complicated. And at that point, anyway, <laughs> What you should you should do, do what you uh, what you should do in practice anyway is bring in a library to take care of it for you. Basically, you'd have to escape that data backslash uh, comma, and then you'd have to go through and make sure that you're looking uh, treating those differently, or you would have to uh, delimit everything with uh, or surround everything with double quotes. Uh, and then now you've got yet another delimiter. So what do you do when there's a double quote in your data? You have to escape that. So there, there, <laughs> there is way more complicated. Uh, than it seems, right? Uh, because there's always this corner case, there's always what if, etc. Use a library in practice. Right? There's a question online of what's uh, the advantage of using sprintf rather than printf? Uh, they seem similar, They're, they are similar, they do the exact same thing, but uh, printf prints to the standard output, sprintf prints to a, a string. Uh, so it depends on what you're trying to do. If you want to print to a string, then print to the standard output, skip the middleman and just print, uh, print to the, out, the standard output. But if you want to print to a string because you want to continue processing stuff and, and uh, concatenate, concatenate, you know, need to do other things, then use sprintf. It's all in what you're trying to do. Right? So again, each piece of data is separated by a delimiter, right? uh, usually a comma or a tab or something like that. Each token of data, data is separated by a delimiter. And that delimiter can change because if you want to, you can process a TSV file, CSV file, or a semicolon uh, uh, SSV, right? Uh, semicolon separated value file, etc. Right? Uh, we want to split the data into separate uh, their separate token, separate tokens, and process each one by itself. Uh, so we'll stick to simple data tokenization where there's one delimiter. You could have multiple delimiters if you really want. Uh, the, way, the way that you do this in C is uh, C provides a function str toke. What do you think the toke stands for? Tokenization, right? Um, it takes two arguments. The first one is the string you want to tokenize, All right? In fact, let me before I do this, let me go ahead and look at the uh, uh, signature of the function. Man, str toke, string tokenization. Right? Don't worry about that second one. That's a re-entrant version. Uh, if you ever get into uh, multi-threaded programming in C, good luck. First of all, second of all, you'll want re-entrant uh, versions of all the functions that you're ever going to use. Uh, uh, re-entrant means that it can re-enter. Uh, and resume uh, computation where it left off, even if one other thread comes in and starts uh, starts computing. Uh, again, don't worry about it for this uh, uh, for this uh, class. All right. So there's str toke. Right. It has a return value of a char star. It's returning a uh, a, a string. 
it takes a string and it takes another string, which is basically a just a delimiter. So it takes two arguments. The first one is the string that you want to tokenize. The second is a string containing uh, the delimiter, delimiters you want to use. We're going to keep it simple, and we're only going to use one delimiter. It still is expecting a string of those delimiters. Right? So let's iteratively build an example over here with using my data over here. Right? And we'll get rid of, oops. Let's go ahead and get rid of all this. And let's go ahead and create a string char data. There we go. I want to process that data. So if I'm going to call str toke, I'm going to pr pass in data as my first argument because that's the thing that I want to tokenize. And what's the delimiter that I want? Well, if I only had one delimiter, then it would be a single uh, a, a comma here. That's not how str toke works though. It allows you to give as many delimiters as you want. I want to tokenize on commas and spaces and tabs and you know end line characters or something like that. We're going to keep it simple though. I only want to tokenize on one delimiter and that's going to be the comma in this case. Okay. Now there is a value that's being returned here, which is, is a char star and I'll call it token. The return value is the token. The return value is the next token, right? So in the first case, it's going to return Chris because that's what the first token is in this data up here. Uh, the second time that I call it, it needs to be called a little bit different, and we'll talk about that in a second here, but it should return the next token, a next token, another token, etc. But before we look at that, I want to call your attention to the first argument again. Char star string. What is that sending a huge red flag to you? There's no const here. What is that telling you? It's going to change your string. The way that it processes it is it looks at, okay, here's, the to here's your first token, CHRS, C. It goes until it sees the first delimiter and says, okay, there, that's the first token right there, Chris. Replaces that delimiter, that, um, uh, that uh, comma, with a null terminating character. It's changing your string and then returning a pointer to the beginning of, the, uh, of that token. Right? So it is modifying your string. Uh, note. STR toke ends up modifying your string. If you don't want that to happen, if you don't want it to change your data, what do you need to do? You need to make a copy of your data and then hand that over to STR toke. What kind of a copy should you make so that when STR toke changes that copy, it doesn't change the original? You need a deep copy, right? Not a shallow copy, okay? Uh, the, uh, the second or each subsequent sequent call to str toke should pass null for the first argument in order for it to continue tokenizing the same string. It's kind of weird the way that it works. If I passed in a new string or the same string over and over again, it would just keep retokenizing the same string from the beginning, right? Every time you pass in a new string for the first argument, it starts tokenizing that string at the beginning of the string. So if you, you, uh, you need to tell it, no, don't start at the beginning, continue where you left off. Or, okay, I'll continue where I left off for your last name, Burke, right? And then continue where you left off for the NUID, et cetera. Right? Let's take a look at, it, at the example here. So printf, uh, First token is going to be percent %s and the line and token. Let's go ahead and call it wrong in the wrong manner. Second token, if I, and of course I can't have two variables called token. So what I'll do is I'll call it the first time on data. I'll call it the second time on data and I'll show you what I'm talking about here. Oops. It's just gonna end up printing out Chris twice because it's starting over on the same string. All right, Chris, okay, that's the end of the string. I didn't see a comma because there is no comma anymore. So here's the first token again. If I keep doing this over and over and over again, then uh, I, will, I will never get anywhere. I'll just keep on doing the same token over and over. I need to pass in null on the second call 
and the third call and the fourth call in order for it to continue tokenizing the same string. Okay. Now when I do this, it should be Chris and then Burke. Okay. Great. Third token, fourth token, fifth token. Does it sound like a good idea to keep doing copy pasta here? Fourth. Okay, there we go. All right, well, that's Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, so two more. Fourth token, fifth token, sixth token. Okay. That'll do them all, right? What happens if I go with a seventh token? Is there a seventh token here? No. So let's find out. Seventh token. What happens when I go beyond the bounds of the string? Nothing bad. It just returns what? Null. Right? So when it gets to the end of the string, it returns null. If there are no more tokens, it returns null. Right? So if there are no more tokens, it returns null. That suggests that we don't have to do this copy pasta, copy pasta, copy pasta. Let's undo all this. Suggest a way that I can do this without having to predict how many tokens there actually are. A while loop. Right. While the token is not null, then continue. Print it out. Print F. Uh, percent uh, token is equal to percent S and the line token. And then update your token for the next call or for the next iteration, excuse me. Token is equal to str token data. Uh, is that right? Predict what's going to happen here. I end up starting over again at Chris. Print it out. It's not null. Infinite loop. Right. There, there are infinite me's. Great. Right. One of us still has to work, though. But then you get into a big argument on who, which one of us does it. Right. <laughs> All right, we'll take turns. You Monday, I'm me Tuesday, etc. <laughs> and then you still get into arguments. Right. It never works. Multiplicity. All right. All right. So what do I need to do? I need to call null instead. And when I do this then of course, I only get the tokens that I'm looking for. It stops when it gets to the end of the string, token ends up becoming null, and I'm done. Right. Cool, cool way of tokenizing. Yeah, go ahead. How, does it like take in the, the whole string copy it and then keep it in its memory? No, it's keeping, uh, the way that it, it's working is that there is a global variable that has a, uh, there's a global pointer variable in the library that's keeping track of where it, le where it left off. Oh, just and where it left off. Yeah, and, and that's, and, yeah, just where it left off. Okay. And then that's why you, if you call it with a, a non-null, then it says, oh, okay, then I'll change this pointer to where I'm going to leave off next time. That's why it's non-re-entrant. You can't re-enter uh, the, the function uh, and expect it to work in a multi-threaded environment because some other thread could have come in and change that pointer with its str toke call. And it's also a reason why you can't have like a loop within a loop. You can't tokenize and then tokenize within the loop because that'll take over control. Mm -hmm. So you, yeah, there, there, there are some issues there that, uh, that are definitely, you have, to, you have to be very careful sometimes. Right? Uh, but you can also do, again, like I said, you can do other uh, uh, tokens. Uh, for example, a three. If you want to tokenize on three, there's a token. There's a token. So I'm going to end up with, oops. Well, yeah, there, oh, there are multiple ones. Oh, say what? Oh, no, sorry. There we go. <laughs> I was tokenizing on one over here and then tokenizing on something different down in my loop. And that's why. Here's what I expected, right? That it's Chris Burke with the comma and then 514 instead of 314 because of course it throws away all of those delimiters. Right? You can have multiple delimiters if you really want to. There we go. Now 103 space, sure, uh, that, that's been tokenized. Uh, if you want uh, another zero, 
Uh, let's also go with uh, an a, a lowercase a, right? Re do really weird stuff if you really want to, right? And it'll tokenize on all of those things. Right? Uh, and then of course you can keep a counter to, because if you uh, are doing error checking, right? Uh, an error handling, do I have valid data? I'm going to expect say seven uh, tokens, right? Was that seven tokens? Yeah, Ch uh, int uh, num expected tokens is equal to seven. And I can go ahead and pr uh, keep a counter, num tokens. Right? I haven't seen any uh, yet, uh, but once I do, num tokens, plus plus. Right? And then you can check if num tokens is not equal to num expected tokens, then error printf data not as expected. Right. You can do tricks like this. Of course, the data should be as expected, right? Because there were seven tokens. Right. Oops, sorry. Uh, we see one, we print it. So one, two, three. Oh, oh, there are only six. Okay. Well, then you saw me not able to count. I can program, but I can't count, apparently. Right. All right. So there are six expected tokens here. Right. All right. Let's see. Finally, something that you did a little bit yesterday, string comparisons. Sorry, string comparisons. Let's go back over the notes. Uh, what uh, function did you use yesterday to compare one string to another string? STR what? Say it again. STR CMP, short for string comparison, right? Uh, in, uh, in C, str cmp is used to compare two string, the contents of two strings. There we go. Remember, you cannot use the equals equals operator. The equals equals operator is only for uh, memory addresses. Right, so uh, I, I, ha I have this in the notes already, except for the uh, error checking, but that's okay. So let's go ahead and go with uh, char uh, a is equal to apple, right? Char b is equal to apple. These have the same contents, but are they stored in the same memory location? Absolutely not. If a is equal to b, then printf must be equal. else printf but they are not right they're they're conceptually equal right because they have the same contents uh, but using the equals equals operator doesn't tell you anything about that they're not equal because one is being stored at one memory location and another is being stored at another memory location just like if you have a one copy of uh, a string with my name in it and then you have a deep copy of my a string with my name in it those two strings are not the same thing this is only comparing memory addresses, right? Uh, the equals equals operator, the equals equals operator only compares memory addresses. And besides, it is, uh, it, even if it worked, it would be limiting. Uh, it, uh, it cannot tell you that one string is less than or greater than another, right? So in other words, we need to bring in some more powerful tool that if I gave you two strings, A and B, uh, that tool could tell you that A comes before B, or it could tell you that B comes before A. In other words, they're out of order, or that they're equal. So it could distinguish between all three of those cases. Right? And that's what STR and, uh, or STRCMP does. Uh, to properly compare strings, use a comparator function, right? STRCMP. If you look up Webster's com uh, for the word comparator, there is indeed no such word. Uh, it is a term of phrase or term, uh, uh, term of art, I guess, uh, if, if you call what we do art. Um, uh, it, uh, it's j basically it's just a, a gerund form of, of the verb compare, a, a comparator, something that compares, right? It takes 
two strings, strings, A and B. Uh, and by the way, they are const strings. It's not gonna, so that may, means that you are sure are assured that they're not going to change. It's not going to change those strings. Man, strcmp. You can see right here that it's const char star s1, const char star s2. It's not going to make changes to your strings. It's just going to look at them and compare them. It's going to, in fact, start at the first character and say, all right, that's the same, that second character, that's the same, third character, that's not the same. This character comes before that character, therefore, this string comes before this string, or the other way around, or it gets all the way to the end and says, oh, they are in fact equal, return zero. Right? Uh, so it takes two strings, it returns something negative if A comes before B. And note there that I am emphasizing something. It does not necessarily return negative one. It doesn't necessarily return negative 42, right? Uh, it returns something negative. You can't inter, uh, there, uh, uh, no, you can't interpret anything about the, the number. It's going to be um, dealer's choice basically on wh whoever wrote the function is, able, uh, is allowed to return whatever they want as long as it's negative, zero or positive, right? Uh, it returns something negative, right? Uh, all, uh, by the way, the return value is always an integer, right? Uh, so it's not going to return negative 3.5 because there are truncation issues right there. Uh, but it is going to return something negative if A comes before B. It returns 0 if A and B have the same contents. Right? It returns something positive. If, a, if B comes before A, or if you want to switch those around, A comes after B, right? Uh, wh however you want to interpret that, right? So let's go ahead and take a look here. Again, we can't use the equals equals operator, right? So let's go ahead and set up a, a different if condition. In fact, I'm just going to call it uh, int uh, result is equal to strcmp of A and B. Right? Now, if R is negative, R is less than zero, then percent a, uh, s comes before percent s, right? and that's going to be a and b. Right? There we go. Else, if r is positive, then that means that they're out of order. So I will use the same thing, but oops, I will reverse them. B comes before a. Else, what's the only other possibility here? If it's not positive and if it's not negative, then it's got to be zero, right? Zero is neither positive or negative, but zero is certainly even, right? Uh, there were some questions on that in the uh, uh, midterm, I believe. Uh, but <laughs> the, the, ho hopefully that, uh, that math is clarified. Uh, percent S and percent S are equal. A. And, and in this case, it doesn't matter. We could go A, B, B, A, or in fact, I could go A, A if they're both the same. All right. All right. I'm comparing apples to apples, or apple to apple, excuse me. So what should I expect? That they are equal. That is not me fat fingering it. It is my five-year-old Mac starting to fail on the keyboard. Actually, the, this is the second or third keyboard that I've had. These uh, uh, these Mac uh, the, the first generation of the like the space bar Mac or the, the yeah but the butterfly switches they are notorious for breaking. Uh, I've already had to replace two keyboards at their expense. Of course, the first one they almost refused to pay for it. Uh, and uh, so do not get a Mac with butterfly keyboards. They don't do them anymore, do they? Thank God. <laughs> Yeah, and I've also had to replace individual keys. Uh, do not get a Mac with a butterfly keyboard. Because uh, I think that they wanted $700 for the, just the keyboard or something like that. Something outrageous. Replace the whole motherboard entirely. <laughs> the third-party <laughs> third keyboard. <laughs> sure, I'll go ahead and uh, add something else to, the, to my tote over here that I have to lug around. <laughs> I already have. If, if, you, if you've never come, you, you can see up here that I've got like adapters for USB-Cs all over the place. Still, five years, or I guess it's 2016. So yeah, four, four and a half years 
uh, I've had to now, yeah, I, and, and I go through those too because you lose and you inevitably lose them. Uh, USB, it's a USB-C, uh, I've, I've got, uh, and I'm not even the worst because there's a colleague that carries around like this, basically this purse of all of these adapters. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's not good. So anyway, back to this. Uh, what if I put in banana? A comparing apples to bananas, which one comes first? Apple. Right. Why? A comes before B. Excellent. You know your ABCs until you don't. Oops. Again, this is my keyboard starting to fail. Which one comes first? Apple or banana? Apple with a uppercase A? Uh, that still works, but what if I did it the other way? Which one of those comes first? Yeah, why banana now? Because it's capitalized, it's ASCII text values. This is not alphabetic order. This is not dictionary order. This is lexiographic ordering, right? Uh, ordering is based, ordering is, ordering is based on ASCII, the ASCII text table, right? That um, uh, uh, it, it is lex, lexi, Graphic ordering, not alphabetic. Right. So, as a consequence, lower up, uppercase letters are going to come before lowercase letters. Not only that, but uh, let's look at something else here: apple and apples. Which one of those comes first? That one does follow a dictionary ordering. Actually, the, no, I, 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 I wouldn't. I wouldn't even say that because. Apples is not in the dictionary. Apple is in the dictionary, and then apples would be like a, a subheading of a pluralization of it or something like that. But in lexiographic ordering, the shorter string comes first. All right? Excellent. Uh, what about numbers? 123 and 90. Which one of those numbers comes first? 123. Why? One comes before nine. It's not looking at that like a number. It's looking at it like a string. One comes before nine, therefore it stops. One, uh, there's a difference, and this, this string comes, uh, comes first, one, 120, uh, 123. If you want to do numeric comparison operations, then you need to convert them to numbers and do the proper comparison, less than or equal to, okay? It is lexicographic ordering, all right? Uh, some alternatives here. Uh, if uh, you can also use also use str case cmp to ignore casing right. so let's go ahead and do that over here uh, let's go ahead and put it back to apple and banana All right and we'll go ahead and go with uh, str case cmp instead now which one of these comes first because it's going to end up ignoring cases it should be apple now Oops. There you go. Apple now comes before banana because we are ignoring the case. Don't ask me. Uh, it, it should be ignore case, right? Uh, by explicitly putting case in there, though, uh, it's 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 kind of the opposite. It's saying that it, it is case sensitive, right? Uh, but it's not. It's putting that in there it, uh, ignores the case. It is a case insensitive version. But of course, numbers, same story here. It's still lexiographic. So 90 would come after 123 because it's not, there's no such thing as an uppercase one. There's no such thing as a lowercase one. Right? It's still going to go with the lexiographic ordering there. It only works, it only makes sense for A through Z. Yet another alternative would be, another alternative would be STR and CMP, which only compares the first n characters right. so let's go ahead and change it to that str n cmp and i only want to compare the first two characters uh, uh, let's say i only want to compare the first five characters and then we'll go ahead and go back to apple and apples right. now comparing only apple it's going to say that those two things are the same because it only compares the first five bytes the five first five characters okay 
Uh, I think STRN case comp. Let's find out if that is a thing. I don't know if it's a thing or not. Yes, it is. Right. Apple and apples are equal. Apple and apples are equal. <laughs> Yay. So you even have yet another one, STRN case comp. Also STRN case comp. Right. N comes before the case. All right. Okay. Any questions? Otherwise, we got done with that in a reasonable amount of time. This, I'm going to go ahead and put these there, here. Uh, that uh, th it gives a lot more uh, uh, examples here. I'll go ahead and include this as well. What we are actually doing. All right. You can play around with it. Uh, I don't think that there's support for Unicode natively, but let's find out since we have a time. Let's go ahead and play around here. Uh, let's say, um, I don't know, uh, list of stupid emojis. All right, so what uh, inside uh, Emojipedia? There, we go. face with a t tear of joys. <laughs> there we go. I don't even know if this will work. This would definitely work if we're in Java. And then a soccer ball. Let's find out which one of these comes first. Do you know? <laughs> STR CMP. <laughs> oh, th I mean, it'll work. Why will it work? They're just numbers at the end of the day, right? Uh, these are just Unicode characters that have some Unicode value. Uh, in fact, this one is, um, okay. Unicode value. Come on. Well, while we're waiting for that to load, well, here we go. All right, it's not finding it. Uh, I guess I have to search for it. Soccer ball, it has 26BD, that's gonna be hexadecimal though. Uh, so 26BD, and what is the other one? like crying tear emoji or something. This one is one uh, F six zero two. I don't know which one of those comes first because I forgot what the first one was. Let's go ahead and find out though. All right, soccer ball <laughs> comes before that, <laughs> whatever that thing is, right? Uh, and so it has an ordering because there's this big giant table of characters, of recognized characters and their numeric codes. Right? And so all you're doing at the end of the day is looking at their numeric codes that have an integer value and saying that this one comes before that one. Whether or not it makes sense, right? <laughs> That's entirely up to your use case. Certainly A through Z makes sense. Uh, other languages that do have a phonetic ordering to their alphabet, that makes sense. Emojis, I don't know if that makes sense or not. <laughs> okay. Uh, any other questions online? No, nope. No? Okay, well then what we're going to do on Monday is we're going to do a uh, file IO uh, and then oh, that's probably only going to take a day because everything that you've, uh, you've basically already learned file IO. Uh, that uh, if you know how to use printf and now you know how to use sprintf, you'll be able to do file output real easy just using fprintf. All it takes is opening a file, printing to a file, closing the file and you're done. That's file output. For file input, it's a little bit different, uh, but I'm going to keep it simple, and I'm going to give you only two functions that uh, that you can use, uh, which are uh, which are going to get um, uh, forgets, where you get a string from a file, you get an entire file line, or forget C, where you are getting file get character. So if you want to read a file character by character, which is kind of inefficient, but you can do it, or if you want to read a file line by line, right? and, uh, and and we'll do that on Monday. Uh, but otherwise, this week, you've got uh, a couple of, uh, in your hack, you've got a couple of uh, uh, strings, uh, string functions that you have to put together. Um, use the standard string library to your, to your benefit, to your advantage. Uh, you know, uh, I don't know if there's anything in there that was a direct, uh, 
a, a, like a direct solution, uh, but certainly things that you can use within your solution. Uh, one, one common mistake people make is thinking that they should use str toke uh, for that string split function. Don't do that. Uh, just, just do it normally. Do, do, it, do it in a straightforward manner. Uh, str toke is for tokenization on a delimiter. Uh, what, you're, what you're doing in that hack exercise is you're splitting it up, say, uh, three characters, three characters, three characters, and creating an array of strings. An array of strings, by the way, looks like what? Char, star, star. It's a two-dimensional array of characters. Each row is a string, right? A null terminated string, of course. Okay? All right. No questions? All right, then. I'll see you next week.